Can you describe the? Do you know the layers and names like corium and all that? Let's I don't. Look it up. I'm not. I, You're I not a leather scientist. I, it's one of those things that I've learned and read probably a hundred times. Well, we'll, it, we'll look at this image here. It, keep, um, it keeps going in and then out. This is. This seems to be the example I'm talking about here. But you're you're saying the grain on the top here. Maybe this illustration would be helpful for people too. Yeah, yeah, it shows because the fibers are the most tightly packed, and on the on the very surface. When you because as you start to get down, things get there's more space in between them, which just means, you know, there's there's just it's just not as dense. So there's you know it, it it's not as strong in, as a as a raw material. But a lot of that can be remedied by again the the tannage and retannage because you're. The retainage specifically, if you look at that picture, the picture here of the corium, which is kind of like a jumble of, it's like a pile, like a pile of leaves that are kind of evenly spaced, spaced out. I mean, you're, all that empty space is what we're filling in when we're tanning. So we want to make sure that there's no voids in there because that's what's going to give the leather strength. I want to give you, you know who out your chef? By the way, Nick's a chef, if you guys didn't know. I used to be Like a, a legit uh, chef cook, cook. Do you go by cook or chef, Nick? I on uh, uh, neither. Do you know actually. who do you know who Alton Alton Brown is? Yes. All right, he's awesome. Uh he had a thing about um he was talking like sp spaghetti or something and, and it sort of reminded me of tanning. Um uh, if you imagine the corium is like when you drain out your spaghetti and you got this like colander or whatever of just like noodles that are sort of they're kind of they're kind of sticky together, but they're not held in place. I always think about that <laughs> bowl of noodles, thinking about leather tanning, is you're fixing all those little strands, all those noodles together, and filling in the voids with tannins, like tree barks and things like that. So continue yeah. on with your with your example here. I actually kind of like this. Uh, yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, I think that, yeah, I mean, I mean, to your, your, what you were saying, I think, is, is correct. I just think that the, you know, the full grain, the grain part of it is, I mean, if you were to, have something that was corrected and something that was full grain and then tan them exactly the same way. The full grain piece of leather would hold up better because it's more abrasion resistant, stronger. But see, I didn't, I didn't, I guess I didn't really know that. And your dad taught me that uh, this week or last week, I suppose he taught me that the um, equine hides, the horse hides have a tougher grain, mm. which I, I didn't really understand. Maybe you could help me understand that. Like he was saying it's abrasion resistant. Right. So if you, Give me an example of where you would see that benefit. Uh, jackets. Yeah. yeah. That's I mean, why so many jackets are made in, in horse. Well, I mean, I think that this is another tangent maybe, but I think that a lot of jackets, I, I think that horse side was actually a secondary jacket material um, when it was adopted. I think that, that sheep, and if I remember my history properly, which is dubious, but... Uh, sheep and goat were generally preferred for jackets, but during, especially like during war times when they were making so many jackets, there just wasn't enough. So horse hide actually came in as like, like a lower cost and a substitute material. But World War One, World War Two, I think, I think I, I should be more sure of these things when I talk about them. And it's being recorded, but but that's uh, <laughs> someone's probably screaming. Like there's so many people that are jacket collectors, and they're probably all screaming or whoever. The two jacket collectors that are listening to this <laughs> are probably screaming at me, but, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's still a traditional material, but I think that, that that's sort of the genesis of that as a product. But I think that it, you know, it's more, it's, it's tough and it ages really well. So I think that so it's you're grown. saying given the same components of a tannage put into two hides, one being equine and one being bovine, you will have a tougher grain and more abrasion resistance on the horse hide. Correct. Okay. Yep. See, I, I, that's, this is news. I'm still learning. And I, I, I think it's kind of fascinating. Yeah. The other thing that's interesting about this diagram and pulled back up is I, I think about, uh, as a leather crafter myself, we want thin pieces of leather often for most of our designs and patterns, making walls and small leather goods and things. So for us, it's really important to not remove too much of the corium because we tend to see it loses a lot of strength, a lot of slit tear strength, and uh, it just rips. The leather rips when you when you thin down the leather, leather too far. 
And I think of this, like this diagram's a really great visual representation of the network of how these fibers all, all work together. So when you start to cut one of them down, like if you start to get into this top section of the corium, there's really like nothing in my mind that holds it together. And this is where I think a lot of a lot of customers come to me with a wallet that's fallen apart. Hey, look at this. All the it's exploded is the words they use. And I see it. It's they have a leather wallet that may or may not have been called like genuine or top grand, or whatever. Um, and they'll come in and, and I'll see, I'll take a look at it. And what it always is is really, really, really thin leather that's been laminated to some non-leather backer. And it's always the leather that's failed because it's it's got nothing to it. It just, you can breathe on it and it sort of rips apart. Uh, th- that's a pet peeve for me. So Yeah, I think that, I mean, we talked, I talked about the grain being the strongest part, but it's, it's only, it's only part of the, like the package. I mean, you, you're right. I mean, even in, at the tannery, we, we don't buy super thick hides to make them into thin hides because you compromise the strength. I mean, you want to buy something that's, I mean, for not only for cost purposes, I mean, for keeping the the price to the customer down, but also for performance purposes, you want to buy stuff that's as sort of as close to the finished weight as you can. Um, without you know giving yourself trouble through the through the actual manufacturing process, but yeah, so you want to look at it as kind of like a package. And I mean, I'm, I can't think of it of a super great example. I mean, maybe like if you think of like a corrugated cardboard, where like the that as a that as like a as a whole unit, mm. it's it's hard to rip the cardboard. But if you were to just to peel off the top layer, then you just have a piece of paper and you can tear it. You can tear it. So it's kind of like, that's a really good example. You're trying yeah. to, you're, it's kind of like the, you know, you're looking at all the layers or like trying to tear a magazine, you know, it's like you, the more layers that you have. And that's not, that's not a great example either, but no, that's pretty, that's, a, I think that's, I mean, it's not a network of fibers, but that's a similar idea. Yeah. They're all working together. Right. Right. 